Iran's nuclear advancements, urgency and diplomacy at a crossroads. In a significant and alarming development, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has revealed that Iran's breakout time, the period required to produce sufficient weapons-grade material for a nuclear weapon, has now been reduced to a mere one or two weeks. This is the shortest breakout time ever acknowledged by U.S. officials and underscores the rapid progression of Iran's nuclear program. Speaking at the Aspen Security Forum, Blinken highlighted the precariousness of the current situation. Where we are now is not in a good place, he stated. The dramatic decrease in breakout time follows the collapse of the nuclear agreement, which previously ensured Iran was at least a year away from achieving this capability. Despite Iran not yet having produced an actual weapon, Blinken emphasized the meticulous monitoring of their activities. The Biden administration remains steadfast in its policy to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, with a preference for achieving this through diplomatic means. Over a year ago, a U.S. Defense Department official warned that Iran could produce enough fissile material for one bomb in approximately 12 days. Efforts to revive the Iran nuclear deal through indirect negotiations ultimately failed in late 2022 due to what the U.S. described as Iran's unreasonable demands regarding an international atomic energy agency probe into unexplained uranium traces at undisclosed sites. With the recent election of Iran's new president, the State Department maintains a cautious outlook noting that true power remains with the supreme leader. A senior State Department official articulated the bleak reality, we're in a very different world. Iran has done a lot of things that make a return to JCPOA non-viable. Matthew Miller, a State Department spokesperson, echoed this sentiment, stating, we have no expectations that this election will lead to a fundamental change in Iran's direction or its policies. The situation with Iran's nuclear program is at a critical juncture. The rapid advancement of their capabilities demands a vigilant and strategic response from the international community. While the prospect of diplomatic resolution remains the preferred path, the actions and policies of Iran in the coming months will be pivotal in determining the future of global security. The world watches closely, hoping for a return to stability and peace through thoughtful and determined efforts. A new chapter at Rafah Crossing, Hope for Peace and Humanitarian Aid In a potential breakthrough for the region, Israeli officials are contemplating a significant move, transferring control of Gaza's Rafah border crossing to the European Union and Palestinian authorities. This bold proposal, while met with skepticism by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is currently the subject of discussions with the EU and the US. If implemented, this shift could herald the end of the long-standing conflict between Israel and Hamas, facilitating increased humanitarian aid to the beleaguered Palestinian territory. The negotiations highlight the EU's renewed diplomatic efforts to alleviate the suffering of Palestinian civilians and push for an end to hostilities. Although Brussels has called for a truce for months, it has struggled to influence the Israeli government's hardline stance against Hamas. Historically, the EU managed the Rafah crossing before 2007, prior to Hamas taking control. Netanyahu, however, has been adamant that Hamas will not regain control of any border areas. His administration insists on maintaining Israeli troops in the vicinity of the crossing and along the Gaza-Egypt border. During a recent visit to Rafah, Netanyahu emphasized the strategic importance of controlling both the Philadelphia Corridor and the Rafah crossing. Tensions have flared between Netanyahu and his generals, with the latter showing more willingness to reopen the crossing, although Netanyahu holds the ultimate decision-making power. The Rafah crossing, linking Gaza and Egypt, has become a focal point of contention. Once a crucial route for aid entering Gaza, it has remained closed since Israeli forces seized it from Hamas in early May. The U.S., United Nations, and several Arab states have called on Israel to reopen the crossing to ensure the flow of essential supplies such as food, fuel, and medicine to Palestinian civilians. White House spokesperson John Kirby emphasized the importance of reopening the crossing in a sustainable and credible manner to facilitate humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Israeli authorities are considering allowing a joint team of security-cleared Palestinian officials and the European Union Border Assistance Mission to Rafah. EUBAM, to manage the crossing. While the exact timeline for reaching an agreement remains uncertain, the urgency of the situation is clear. 
The EU has expressed its readiness for EUBAM to resume its role at the crossing, pending the establishment of necessary arrangements. As Prime Minister Netanyahu prepares for his upcoming meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington, where he will also address Congress, the international community watches closely. This visit, his first trip outside Israel since the war began in October, is seen as a pivotal moment in the ongoing conflict. The proposed transfer of control over the Rafah crossing represents a glimmer of hope amidst the turmoil. It signifies a potential path toward peace and a lifeline for the many Palestinian civilians in dire need of humanitarian aid. The coming weeks will be critical in determining whether this proposal can transform from a diplomatic discussion into a tangible reality that fosters stability and relief in the region. ICJ Ruling A Landmark Decision on Israeli Settlements In a historic ruling, the International Court of Justice, ICJ, has declared Israel's annexation of Palestinian territories through its settlement policies as illegal under international law. This landmark decision, delivered by a 15-judge panel, states unequivocally that Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem are a violation of international statutes. The ICJ's non-binding advisory opinion underscores that Israel's application of its domestic laws to these territories, along with its extensive regulatory control, solidifies its grip on occupied lands. The court has called for an immediate end to Israel's presence in the West Bank, advocating for the evacuation of all settlements to facilitate the return of displaced Palestinians to their homes. Despite its non-binding nature, this ruling marks one of the most significant international judicial decisions since the establishment of the first settlements in 1967. Israeli officials fear that this verdict could pave the way for sanctions from Western nations, including the United States. Globally, the United Nations and most countries view the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem as occupied territories. Israel, which did not officially participate in the legal proceedings, collaborated covertly with its allies to present its case in court. The ICJ emphasized that Israel's policies and protection of settlements have led to increased violence against Palestinian civilians. The ruling calls on the UN General Assembly and the Unsecurity Council to contemplate further actions. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas hailed the decision as a victory for justice, urging Israel to cease its occupation immediately. Nevertheless, the ruling is unlikely to alter Israeli government policies significantly, given the pro-settlement stance of key ministers within Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition. Netanyahu has dismissed the ruling as a false decision, asserting that the Jewish people are not occupiers in their ancestral lands. He insists that no decision from The Hague can negate what he views as the historical and legal legitimacy of Israeli settlements. Israeli President Isaac Herzog and other prominent officials, such as Finance Minister Betzalel Smotrich and National Security Minister Itamar ben Gvir, have also rejected the ICJ's opinion. Some ministers have even called for the annexation of the West Bank in response. Israel's control over the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and the Golan Heights dates back to the Six-Day War in 1967. While Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, Around 500,000 Israelis continue to live in settlements across the West Bank, often in outposts deep within Palestinian territories. The issue of settler violence against Palestinians has intensified, especially following recent attacks. The ICJ's ruling represents a significant moment in the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine, highlighting the international community's stance on Israeli settlements. While the immediate impact on Israeli policy may be limited, this decision adds a powerful voice to the call for justice and the end of occupation. The path forward remains fraught with challenges, but this ruling serves as a reminder of the enduring need for peace, dialogue, and respect for international law. Adidas faces backlash after dropping Bella Hadid over Gaza controversy. In a move that has sparked widespread debate, Adidas announced on Friday that it has removed supermodel Bella Hadid from its latest advertising campaign amid controversy surrounding her outspoken support for Palestinian rights. This campaign, which aimed to relaunch the SL72 sneaker originally introduced at the 1972 Munich Olympics, inadvertently touched a nerve given the tragic events of that year when 11 Israeli athletes were killed by the Palestinian group Black September. 
Adidas's decision comes in the wake of intense criticism from pro-Israeli groups who were outraged by the inclusion of Hadid, a model of Palestinian descent known for her vocal stance on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The Israeli embassy in Germany and other critics condemned Adidas for featuring Hadid, accusing her of spreading anti-Semitic sentiments and inciting violence against Israelis and Jews. Adidas has issued an apology, stating, We are conscious that connections have been made to tragic historical events, though these are completely unintentional, and we apologize for any upset or distress caused. The company confirmed that it would be revising the remainder of the campaign. Bella Hadid has participated in numerous pro-Palestinian demonstrations and has been particularly active since the October 7 Hamas attack on Israel, which led to the current conflict in Gaza. She has described Israel's military actions as a genocide, drawing both support and backlash on social media. This controversy follows Adidas's previous decision to cut ties with the artist formerly known as Kanye West, now Yee, after his anti-Semitic remarks. The company's sensitivity to such issues is heightened by Germany's historical context and its strong support for Israel amidst the ongoing conflict. The decision by Adidas to drop Bella Hadid from its campaign underscores the complex and often contentious intersection of business, politics, and social issues. As brands navigate these turbulent waters, the reactions from various communities reflect broader societal tensions. This incident serves as a reminder of the powerful impact public figures and corporations have in shaping discourse and the responsibilities they bear in the global arena. Intel reveals Russia's plan to arm Houthis with anti-ship missiles amid rising Middle East tensions. In a startling revelation, U.S. intelligence agencies have warned that Russia may be arming Yemen's Houthi rebels with advanced anti-ship missiles. This potential arms transfer comes in response to Ukraine's use of American weapons on Russian territory, according to a report by the Wall Street Journal. This development adds a new layer of complexity to the already volatile situation in the Middle East, with Israel now threatening to strike Yemen following a deadly Houthi drone attack on Tel Aviv. The White House has launched a confidential push to prevent Moscow from delivering these missiles to the Iranian-backed Houthis. The rebels, who have been attacking shipping in the Red Sea region for the past eight months, claim solidarity with Palestinians under siege by Israel since the Hamas incursion on October 7. This new intelligence has heightened concerns about the how this capability to threaten U.S. Navy vessels directly with these advanced weapons. The Biden administration's diplomatic efforts to curb this arms transfer involve using a third country to persuade Russian President Vladimir Putin not to proceed. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy has intensified its operations against the Houthis in the Red Sea, marking its most intense warfare at sea in decades. Despite these efforts, the threat persists, as the Houthis continue to launch attacks on shipping and military assets in the region. The recent deadly drone attack on Tel Aviv, which marked the first lethal Houthi strike on Israel, has escalated tensions further. The Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, acknowledged that the drone, which evaded air defenses, was targeting the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. Israeli officials are now considering a military response on Yemeni soil, raising fears of a wider regional conflict. This alarming development underscores the intricate and perilous dynamics of the Middle East. As global powers navigate these turbulent waters, the potential for further escalation remains high. The involvement of Russia, Iran, and the U.S. in this complex geopolitical chess game could have far-reaching consequences, not only for the region but for global security. Houthis escalate attacks on global shipping amid Gaza conflict. In a dramatic escalation of hostilities, Yemen's Houthi rebels have struck and damaged a Singapore-flagged container ship, Lobivia, with two missiles as it sailed in the Gulf of Aden. This attack marks a significant increase in the how this aggressive campaign against global shipping driven by the ongoing conflict between Israel and Gaza. The overnight assault on Lobivia left visible damage to the ship's port side, though thankfully, all crew members are reported safe. The ship was located 83 nautical miles southeast of Yemen's port city of Aden at the time of the attack. Eyewitnesses described seeing a light and blast in the vicinity, indicating the severe impact of the missiles. The ship performed evasive maneuvers and switched off its automatic identification system shortly after the attack to avoid further strikes. 
This latest attack is part of a broader pattern of increasingly sophisticated assaults by the Iran-aligned Houthis. In June, they sank the Greek-owned Tudor coal carrier using missiles and an explosive-laden remote-controlled boat. Since November, the how this attacks on commercial shipping have claimed the lives of at least three sailors and disrupted global trade by forcing ship owners to avoid the crucial Suez Canal route. Gerald Firestein, director of the Arabian Peninsula Affairs Program at the Middle East Institute in Washington, highlighted the growing capabilities of the Houthis. Their capacity, their access to more sophisticated weapons, has only increased over the course of this conflict, Firestein noted. The Houthis also claimed responsibility for a deadly drone strike in Tel Aviv that killed one man and injured four others. This escalating pattern of attacks underscores the rebels' enhanced ability to inflict damage on their targets, posing a significant threat to regional stability and global maritime trade. In response to these threats, Britain and the U.S. have conducted retaliatory strikes, targeting drone and missile launch sites in Yemen. However, the cost of these operations is mounting with Firestein pointing out, we're basically spending a million dollars every time we shoot down a Radio Shack drone. That's wearing on the Navy and wearing on our supplies. As the Houthis continue to escalate their attacks, the implications for global trade and regional security are profound. The international community must remain vigilant and coordinated in their response to these threats, ensuring the safety of maritime routes and the protection of civilian lives. WHO issues urgent warning as polio virus detected in Gaza Strip. We bring you critical news today as the World Health Organization, WHO, has discovered the polio virus in the Gaza Strip, raising significant public health concerns. In late June, the polio virus was found in six different areas within Gaza. Although no infections or paralysis cases have been reported yet, WHO spokesman Christian Lindmeier emphasized that the virus was isolated from the environment, specifically from sewers that have been severely impacted by the ongoing conflict. WHO is collaborating with local authorities to assess the risk and determine the best course of action. One of the potential responses is an immediate vaccination campaign, especially considering the destruction of many health facilities and the dire hygienic conditions in Gaza. The chances of preventing the spread of polio through vaccination are notably higher in such precarious situations. The Israeli Health Ministry has already taken proactive measures by ordering all soldiers deployed in Gaza to be vaccinated against polio, including booster doses for those previously vaccinated. The situation is dire, with open sewage pools forming in some areas due to the destruction of the sewage system, further increasing the risk of virus spread. The Hamas-controlled Gaza Health Ministry has warned that the presence of viruses in sewers near refugee tents could lead to a health catastrophe, putting thousands of people at risk of infection. As the international community watches closely, it is imperative that swift and coordinated efforts are made to contain the virus and prevent an outbreak. The discovery of polio in Gaza is a stark reminder of the urgent need for comprehensive health interventions in conflict zones. Crypto CEO resigns amid controversy over incendiary remarks. In a dramatic turn of events, Ryan Selkies, the outspoken CEO of the prominent cryptocurrency data company Masari, has resigned following his incendiary comments on social media. This newsletter provides a detailed account of the unfolding situation. Selkies, known on social media platform X as 2 bit idiot stepped down from his leadership position after a series of inflammatory posts following an assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump in Pennsylvania. His posts, which have since been deleted, included violent rhetoric against non-Trump supporters, sparking widespread outrage and concern. In the wake of the attempt on Trump's life, Selkies wrote, anyone that votes against Trump at this point can die in AF, G fire. He further declared, the civil war for the country started today and if you are anti-Trump you are against the men who are willing to fight. Good luck. Selkies later expressed his frustration with the media and government, blaming them for divisive rhetoric and systemic failures. He announced his resignation, stating that his political stance had put his team at risk and that he would now focus on addressing systemic issues within American institutions. Masari, a company founded by Selkies in 2018 and backed by significant financial institutions, will now be led by Eric Turner, though Turner has not yet commented on the transition. 
The resignation comes at a critical time for the cryptocurrency industry, which is experiencing increasing political alignment and advocacy for favorable regulations. The intersection of cryptocurrency and politics is highlighted by Donald Trump's recent embrace of the industry. The Republican nominee has included support for crypto in his party's platform, pledging to end what he calls the Democrats' unlawful and un-American crypto crackdown and to oppose the creation of a central bank digital currency. Trump is also scheduled to speak at the upcoming Bitcoin conference in Nashville, reflecting the growing ties between his campaign and the crypto world. Ryan Selke's resignation underscores the volatile mix of politics and cryptocurrency. As the industry seeks mainstream acceptance, the fallout from such high-profile controversies highlights the delicate balance between advocacy and responsible leadership. As always, we will continue to monitor and report on these developments, providing you with the latest updates. Germany and Serbia strike historic lithium deal amid environmental concerns. We have a groundbreaking update for you. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz has praised a monumental deal between Serbia and the European Union, marking a significant step toward reducing Europe's dependency on China for critical raw materials. This agreement, however, comes with its share of controversy and opposition. On Friday, a memorandum of understanding was signed at a critical raw materials summit in Belgrade, Serbia. This strategic partnership aims to secure sustainable raw materials, bolster battery supply chains, and advance electric vehicle production. Scholz hailed this as an essential European project, crucial for maintaining Europe's sovereignty in a rapidly changing global landscape. This decision required courage, but it was made at the right moment, Scholz stated, emphasizing the necessity for Europe to discover new sources of raw materials to avoid dependency on other nations. Germany, as Europe's largest car manufacturer, is in urgent need of securing lithium for electric vehicle production. Currently, China dominates the lithium-ion battery supply chain, making this deal a pivotal move for Europe's automotive industry. However, the project is not without its critics. Environmentalists and opposition groups have fiercely contested the excavation plans. The Serbian Constitutional Court recently overturned a previous ruling that had cancelled a $2.4 billion mining project by British-Australian company Rio Tinto in the Jadar Valley, one of Europe's largest lithium deposits. Protests erupted across Serbia in 2021, with thousands blocking major roads and bridges, voicing concerns over potential environmental hazards. Despite a heavy police presence at the signing ceremony, activists remain determined to oppose the mining activities. Zlatko Kakanovic, an anti-mining activist, passionately stated, We will defend ourselves with all means, because we have no other backup state. There are some of us who think with our own heads and not with Scholz's head, who only has in mind his own profits and interests. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic assured that the lithium excavation would adhere to the highest ecological standards and stress the economic benefits. He envisions the deal as a quantum leap into the future for Serbia, potentially bringing billions of dollars in investments and transforming the nation's economy. Vucic emphasized that the project would proceed only if automakers and battery producers build factories in Serbia, thereby creating local jobs and ensuring that raw materials are not merely exported. The agreement is seen as a significant boost for Serbia's EU membership aspirations and a major achievement for Vucic's administration. European Commission Vice President Maro Sefcovic described the deal as a historic opportunity for both Serbia and the EU. This landmark deal between Germany and Serbia is a double-edged sword, offering immense economic potential while raising serious environmental and social concerns. As Europe strives for greater independence from China in critical raw materials, the balance between development and ecological preservation will be closely watched. German medic sentenced to death in Belarus. A controversial verdict. We have a gripping and alarming story to share with you today. Belarus has sentenced a German combat medic, Rico Krieger, to death by firing squad, a decision that has stirred international outcry and deep concern. Rico Krieger, a 30-year-old former medical worker for the German Red Cross and armed security officer for the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, was convicted under six articles of Belarus's criminal code. The charges, including terrorism and mercenary activity, were brought against him in a secretive trial held at the end of June, according to the Vyasna Human Rights Center. 
The trial, shrouded in secrecy, left many details unclear, including the exact allegations against Krieger. Belarus's official news agency remained silent on the matter, adding to the mystery and controversy surrounding the case. The case may be linked to the Kalinuski Regiment, a group of Belarusian volunteer fighters actively engaged in the war against Russia in Ukraine. Krieger's alleged involvement with this regiment, which is deemed an extremist group in Belarus, might have been a significant factor in his conviction. Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, currently living in exile, expressed her concern over the reports and is seeking more information about Krieger's case. The German foreign ministry has also stepped in, providing consular services and advocating on Krieger's behalf. A spokesperson reiterated Germany's staunch opposition to the death penalty, labeling it as a cruel and inhuman form of punishment. Belarus stands alone in Europe as the only country that still enforces the death penalty, primarily for severe crimes like murder under aggravating circumstances, terrorism, and treason. Since gaining independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, Belarus is reported to have executed as many as 400 people, but executions of foreign citizens remain rare. This case highlights the stark realities and controversies surrounding Belarus's justice system under the authoritarian regime of Alexander Lukashenko. Krieger's sentencing has not only drawn attention to the harsh penalties in Belarus but also raised questions about the fairness and transparency of its legal proceedings. As we continue to monitor this developing story, the international community's response and efforts to intervene will be crucial in determining Krieger's fate. Stay tuned for more updates on this critical issue. Russian military delegation lands in North Korea to solidify Putin's strategic pact. We have a significant update from the heart of East Asia. A high-level Russian military delegation has arrived in North Korea to advance the implementation of strategic agreements forged during President Vladimir Putin's recent visit to Pyongyang. On July 19, a delegation led by Russian Deputy Defense Minister Alexei Krivoruko touched down in North Korea's capital. This visit marks a pivotal moment in the burgeoning partnership between Russia and North Korea, following the signing of a Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Pact on June 19, 2024. During President Putin's visit, the two nations sealed a commitment to mutual defense, promising to support each other in the event of aggression. This landmark agreement signifies a deepening alliance between the two countries, reflecting a significant geopolitical shift in the region. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov highlighted the importance of this visit, describing it as a critical step in implementing the agreements reached during Putin's trip. The discussions between the Russian delegation and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un are set to focus on the practicalities of this strategic partnership. The visit underscores the strengthening military and political ties between Russia and North Korea, raising questions about the broader implications for regional stability and international relations. As the Russian military delegation works to cement the agreements made, the world watches closely. The deepening ties between Moscow and Pyongyang signal a notable shift in global geopolitics. The outcomes of these discussions could have far-reaching impacts on regional security dynamics and international diplomacy. U.S. vows support for Philippines' South China Sea resupply mission amid tensions. In a bold move underscoring its commitment to regional security, the United States has pledged to support the Philippines in its efforts to resupply a ship stationed on the contested Second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan announced on Friday that the U.S. will do what is necessary to ensure the Philippines can resupply the Sierra Madre, a warship deliberately grounded on the shoal since 1999 to bolster Manila's claims in the disputed waters. Addressing the Aspen Security Forum in Colorado, Sullivan emphasized that while the U.S. prefers the Philippines to carry out the resupply mission, it stands firmly behind its ally. He reiterated that the mutual defense treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines applies to the Sierra Madre, signaling a strong stance against any potential aggression. The Sierra Madre is not just a ship but a symbol of the Philippines' assertion of its territorial claims in the South China Sea, a region increasingly contested by China. The U.S. support highlights the strategic importance of this mission and the broader implications for regional stability. As tensions continue to simmer in the South China Sea, the U.S. commitment to aiding the Philippines in this crucial resupply mission sends a clear message of solidarity and support. 
The move not only reinforces the U.S.-Philippine alliance but also emphasizes the need for de-escalation and adherence to international norms in the face of rising geopolitical friction. Beijing fumes over Japan-Taiwan Coast Guard drill. A tense maritime tango. In a dramatic display of geopolitical tension, Beijing has vocally protested Japan's recent joint Coast Guard exercise with Taiwan, marking a significant moment in East Asian diplomacy. On Friday, China lodged a formal protest with Japan after Tokyo's Coast Guard participated in a rare joint rescue drill with its Taiwanese counterpart. The exercises, conducted on Thursday south of Tokyo, Yokohama, were the first of their kind in over half a century. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Lin Jian expressed Beijing's strong dissatisfaction, criticizing Japan for what it sees as a violation of past commitments not to support Taiwanese independence. Lin urged Japan to adhere strictly to the One China Principle and avoid actions that could destabilize regional peace. The joint training involved Japan's patrol vessel Sagami, equipped with a helicopter, and Taiwan's patrol ship Soon Hu No. 9. According to Japanese officials, the exercise was aimed at enhancing maritime rescue capabilities and was conducted in line with a 2017 agreement on search and rescue operations. Tokyo has stressed that the drill was not intended to target any third country, including China. The timing of this drill underscores the ongoing maritime disputes and complex diplomatic relations in the region. Japan and China continue to clash over the Diaoyu, Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, while Beijing's claims in the South China Sea are contested by several nations. The Taiwan Strait remains a flashpoint, with Beijing viewing Taiwan as a breakaway province to be reunified with the mainland, potentially by force. This recent maritime exercise between Japan and Taiwan highlights the fragility of East Asian geopolitics. As Beijing and Tokyo navigate their fraught relationship, the joint drill serves as a reminder of the region's tense dynamics and the delicate balance that must be maintained to avoid further escalation.